try to get started here. Okay, how's the, uh, how's the sound? Can everybody hear me okay? Louder? All right, let's, uh, okay, technology. Check, check. How's that? Maybe we could go up just a tad on the sound. All right. All right, everybody, let's get started. First of all, thank you for coming. Uh, somebody asked me, do you want an introduction? And I thought, no, let's just get going, okay. Um, if you wanna know a little bit more about me, there's a, a bio in your program. Um, but my name is Ann Bickley. If you were here yesterday, I described myself as an out-of-bounds biologist. And you'll see that that is, um, that's pretty true. Here's a couple other things to know about me in addition to that. I have a very bad case of plant lust, as you are um, about to learn. I like explainers, I like science, I like history. And with that, we're gonna get going right away. Okay, so The Hidden Half of Nature. This is a book that I co-wrote with my husband, David Montgomery, who you may or may not have seen his, his talk um, right before this, but this was a book that was, uh, it was an odyssey, it, it was really sort of a long odyssey in the exploration of the world of soil, and as it turns out, the world of the human gut, sort of framed up by this emerging new area of science that we call the microbiome. And the protagonists in our book are none none other than microorganisms. And I'm sure that uh, some of you are familiar with all, if not most of these, certainly viruses, bacteria, and fungi. And archaea, archaea are quite interesting. The other name for them is the ancient ones. And uh, protists, of course, are these amoeboid kind of organisms. And all of these figure prominently in microbiome research, whether you're talking the soil or the gut. And so when it comes to the microbial world, one of the, one of the things that's so confounding about it is that we simply cannot see them with the naked eye. And what we tend to not be able to see, we tend to discount, right? So this is just a way to give you a really good idea of how small are these things. These are two scales, one for the invisible world, one for the visible world. And each of these bars represents an order of magnitude up in size. So that's to say that DNA down here, teeny tiny stuff, you come up 10 orders of magnitude and that's about how big a virus is. And then likewise, bacteria are about 10 times bigger than virus, chloroplast 10 times bigger. Red blood cells are giant in terms of this scale that I'm talking about. And then you jump over to the visible world, and if you have a really good eye, you can see amoeba-type things. And we jump up thusly until we get to us. So fully half, actually, it, it's, it turns out to be more than half of life is of a size that we cannot easily observe. And this is what we call the hidden half of nature. And our story begins here in Seattle with our house that is this year 100 years old. So we're happy it's still standing. Uh, and in particular, when we got our house, I was jonesing for a garden big time. I had the bug, I had the bug so bad. I had gardened in little patches here and there uh, through throughout most of my sort of life after I had moved away from where I grew up, which was in Colorado. And here at last, I saw this as one grand blank slate. But also, it was not exactly a dream garden in this condition. This is, this is more, more of an old growth lawn, which you, you will see a lot of in Seattle, but it's completely monotonous, it's very boring, and so I had, I had dreams and schemes for this area. Now, unfortunately, you would have thought that the biologist and her geologist husband would have taken a closer look at our soil. Because I don't need to tell anybody in this room that this is not dream soil, 
right? In the Northwest, as in other, other areas of the country, the Northeast being one of them, we have a history of glaciers. And in Seattle, we have what's called glacial till. This stuff is like concrete. So what am I going to do? We, I don't have a picture of it, but we got stuck at a really bad time putting this garden in. Even in Seattle, our summers can be quite hot and very dry and very droughty. And we ended up putting all of the plants in through a series of mishaps and mistakes uh, in the middle of August. So this was my nightmare. I had nightmare soil. I had a nightmare watering regime. And uh, after I freaked out about that, I got going on what I call the organic matter chronicles. This was my journey to try and deal with the crappy soil and the very, very dry conditions that we were facing at the time that we put this garden in. So after freaking out, I got busy. I got my wheelbarrow and I painted it up with flames and I need to add some microbes to this. My next paint job is gonna be microbes all over the wheelbarrow, okay? Yeah, exactly. And I began filling up that wheelbarrow with as much organic matter that was free and cheap and close by. And so among the things that I used, wood chips were a go-to. That, that was my go-to source. Uh, we have a lot of trees in the Seattle area. Arborists are dying to get rid of their wood chips because otherwise they need to drive them to the landfill and dump them. And this is, why would you be throwing away something that, you, that is microbe food? That was my, per, that was my perspective. And in addition, um, pile C here is something really unique. It's Zoodoo. In Seattle, our zoo collects the manure from herbivores and composts it. And gardeners flock twice a year to the zoo. It's a lottery type system. And if you're lucky enough to get your postcard drawn, you can show up at the zoo and you can get as much Zoodoo as your car or your truck or whatever can hold. So far, I haven't seen anybody there in a semi truck. These are the neighbor's pine needles. After a few years, we were generating our own organic matter. These are leaves of a, of a, of a tree and some grass clippings. And so with, with all of my beloved organic matter, I would make mulches, right? And in this particular mulch mix, it is hinoki clippings. Hinoki is a kind of an evergreen. And so I'm collecting a lot of fresh material, especially during the growing season. And as I collect that, I will usually put wood chips in the bottom of my barrow, and I will start mixing in all kinds of green things. The neighbors, I will tell you, there's a lot of biomass on a hydrangea bouquet, all right? So you can enjoy that for a day or two, and then you go put that in the barrow, and you start mixing it up. And then lastly, my decaying wood chips. So. I would, I, I'm pretty constantly in the, in the spring and the summertime pruning things. I'll either stash them in a pile somewhere or I'll get going right away on mixing mulch. And with my mulches, we all had this idea. I don't know where we got it. I'm sort of cursing Alan Chadwick if anybody knows who he is. This, there was this idea that we needed to double dig our beds. And so there we were breaking our backs and breaking the backs of a lot of soil microorganisms, I'll add, digging and digging and turning our soil over and thinking, gosh, we've got to mix this organic matter in. Okay, I didn't have time to do that. I had a much bigger garden to deal with. And so that very first summer, I just started laying stuff on top, on top of the beds. And this is the fate of all of my mulches. I lay it on top of the beds and the microorganisms come and get it. This is like people in an office environment. You put donuts out, what happens? <laughs> Flock to the donuts. So you don't need to run around, you don't need to walk around and serve donuts. You put them there and people will come. And that's what goes on with organic matter. I also did the living goods. So this is compost tea. I'm sure many of you in this room have brewed it. You have used it. And for me, it, it was something I used quite a bit when the garden was getting established because plants are vulnerable just like people early in their life and they need help and they need support. 
And so that's when I was using a lot of compost tea. I would, you can read about in the book, I felt like an absolute um, garden fairy because I found this wonderful trombone sprayer in a garden catalog and it put a mist, a fine, fine mist out on whatever I was spraying. So that could be a tree, that could be um, the soil itself. If I had any plants that were ailing whatsoever, a spritz of compost tea generally took care of the problem. And so by five, six, seven years, we're now um, actually 15 years out or so from putting the garden in. And this is the upshot of all of this, of this, of the organic matter in the biology is that if you got dirt, which we had, this is the glacial till that we were dealing with. You layer your organic matter on the top and you can get soil, all right? This is, this is, this is both beguiling and it's a mystery and it's also very, very simple. Nature has made soil in this way forever and ever, only it takes her a lot longer. It takes nature about a century or so, depending on exactly where you are, to make one inch of fertile topsoil. And here, here was something. You don't beat nature at much, because she's really good. But I had been able to create a couple, couple inches or so of topsoil in pretty short order. And What's interesting about this, I was always down in the dirt. I was doing all of this heavy lifting. The husband geologist co-author was inside <laughs> looking out the window going, oh, there goes the wheel, there goes Ann in the wheelbarrow again. And so we started to look at our soil and noticed this. And he went, aha, I think we're making soil a lot faster than nature could. And so that was when we realized, wow, we really started doing something here. My, my brawn and his brain put this story together. And so if, if we've got all of that biology going on underground, what is going on above ground? This is what is going on above ground. This was Eden to me. This was finally my garden dream. And I'll, I'll just ask you to keep this uh, peak of that roof in your mind's eye here for the next couple slides. And I know this is a conference about food, but if you have a bad case of plant lust, you want all kinds of plants in your garden. You want ornamentals, you want beautiful trees, you want your veg bed, right? And in later years is when we really started the veg bed. And what's interesting is that all my various mulches and things um, that I had been layering onto the soil, I also had a worm bin. And the veg beds, because I'm growing food, these got extra special attention. So this got, the veg beds got all the worm compost, biochar, various other concoctions. And we did uh, measured carbon uh, in different places in the garden several years ago. And what we found is veg beds start, all of this soil, all of the soil on our lot, when we started out was about one or 2% organic matter, because there's an area behind the garage that we never touched, so that was our baseline. Uh, the veg beds are up now around 12% carbon. You go out to our, our, our eco lawn, this is a mix of cool season grasses and some herbs and forbs, that's at about seven or 8% carbon. And then in the ornamental beds, we've got about five or 6% carbon. So, right, I'm just layering this stuff on and the microbes are doing the work to get that carbon into the soil. And so there was food, there was beauty, there was solace, there was comfort. This is what we can get from gardens. And in particular, flowers, right? Flowers are in part much, much, um, much of a garden soul in life. And I wanted to feed pollinators, right? They need a diet too, they need food as well. So summertime is when I especially like being in the garden, as any and probably most of you know, it's when all the insects are out. That's when the life that we can see is out and it connects us. It connects us to other life forms, I believe. 
All right. So I, I was doing the heavy lifting. Me and the barrel were do the, doing the heavy lifting, but I had trillions of allies on my side, and they were doing the heavy processing of all of that organic matter. There, there were the chewers, what I call the chewers and chompers. There are the grinders. There is a lot of work that goes on in the gizzard of an earthworm. There were what are called the mesofauna. These are, we can't, if you have a really, really good eye, you might be able to see some of the mesofauna. This is a springtail, and this is a mite. Mites abound in the soil. Some of them are microbes. Because there are, in a really healthy soil, it is so chock full of microorganisms, and they die. And you do analyses on that organic matter, and you'll find there's an awful lot of bacterial carcasses in the organic matter of soil. And I want to just refresh. I know you all know this stuff, but I, I sometimes find it instructive to come up to a really high level and stand back and just go, yeah, what is it again that plants are eating? What is their diet? And a plant diet comes from basically three places. From the atmosphere, of course, carbon and nitrogen. Part of the diet comes from the earth itself, from the rocks, minerals, and so on. Water comes out of the earth. And the third place the plant diet comes from is itself. All of that organic matter, right? Dead leaves, dead roots, wood, and so on. But there's something more to this picture and that is in part what has been so exciting about the plant microbiome research because there's an area called the rhizosphere. The rhizosphere is a wild and alive world that we all need to know far, far more about. Here it is. And the rhizosphere is, is you picture a nanometer to millimeter wide zone that is around each and every root hair on a plant. It's a halo-like zone that surrounds plant roots, and it's thought to be one of the most life-dense places on this planet, around the roots of plants. And the other thing that has come out about the rhizosphere and the microbiome is that plants release exudate cocktails. We used to think, oh, it's probably just mostly carbohydrates. Well, it's carbohydrates, it's amino acids, turns out also lipids or fats. So this is a restaurant. This is a restaurant for the microbial masses. And what we know is that the plants get most of their energy from photosynthesis. They'll use about 30% of that photosynthetic derived energy to produce these exudates, push them out in their roots. Now, if you think about it, would any of us give away a third of our salary, a third of something that's very, very precious to us, and set it out there for somebody else? No, that's a, that, that, that's a big hit. So why are plants doing this? Because here's the answer. If you take a close look at the rhizosphere, it's really what we call a biological bazaar. This is this is a grand trading area, folks. What you've got is the exudates are flowing out of the roots, cocktails. Depending on who's out here, plants will gin up different kinds of cocktails, different kinds of carbohydrates, and mixing in these other things, amino acids, fats, and so on. And in return, let's just, let's, let's replace microbial with bacterial for a moment here. Bacteria are consuming those exudates, and either directly or indirectly, they're making things with those exudates. We call them metabolites. And these metabolites, many of them come back into the plant, and some of them are things like plant growth promoting hormones. So here a plant is, with its monopoly on carbon, producing these exudates because it can, Bacteria can't photosynthesize, and they are hungry for donuts. You'll hear Elaine Ingham call them cakes. You'll hear her call exudates cakes and cookies. And so they're devouring these, and these metabolites are taken back up by the plant. I mean, how often do you have one kingdom of nature supplying another kingdom of nature 
with growth hormones. This is, this is symbiosis on a grand, grand scale. And of course, fungi we know, they're off over here collecting things, minerals. Phosphorus is a really important thing they collect. And then, pipe it back. They drop off the minerals, they pick up some carbohydrates, and here you have the botanical world accessing things far, far away from their stuck-in-place bodies. This is, this is genius, right, on the part of the botanical world, that they have developed these symbiotic relationships with other organisms to help them get what they need. And this is just a close-up of what we call our fetching fungi some fragment, tiny, tiny fragment of rock. These fungal hyphae are exuding acids at the tips of their hyphae that are dissolving out minerals from the rocks. And it turns out in the literature, what's happening out here at the ends of these fungal hyphae is there are more symbioses. There are certain bacteria that associate with fungi to help them break down those rocks and it's posited that carbohydrates from the plant are coming through the fungi. There's a delivery of the bacteria here that helps the fungi break down those rocks. So this is symbiosis nested within symbioses. And this is also part of the plant defense strategy. What will happen above ground is that you get an insect herbivore that starts munching and the plant sends signals down to the root system and this activates certain kinds of microbes to start manufacturing metabolites that the plant takes back up that spurs various biochemical defense pathways in the plant. So the plant's not in all cases making its own defensive compounds, it's relying on the genomes very, the, 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 the hundreds of kinds of different genes that are held in its microbiome to make defensive, make, to make compounds that communicate, yeah, let's get, let's spur basically the plant immune system and get this herbivore off of my back and onto somebody else's back. So what what we really have here is below ground intelligence. We might think a plant is like us and that the brain is at the top, but it's really inverted with the botanical world. The brain is the root system, really, when you think about it. And to have, we all know, brain food is really important, and it, it's exactly the case for the microbial world. Um, and the plant world as well. So there's three different treatments on these roots. One was conventional, one was, and I, I skipped on the slide so you, if you were smart you looked at that. One was nothing, one was conventional fertilizers, and one was composted manure. And so here were the three treat treatments. Doing nothing isn't half bad, right? The botanical world has gotten along just fine without us for a long, long time. It's figured a lot of this stuff out. Conventional treatments do this below ground. We've all seen what happens above ground with conventional treatments. Plant looks nice and lush and beautiful, but this is, this is anemic. This is unhealthy. This is not a robust rhizosphere. Here's what we really want. We want this wild and alive place to be growing. We want it to be active. We want it to be communicating. This is this is what the plant world is all about. And so this is why it matters a lot what we are feeding the soil because this becomes the brain food for our plants. And so you know the answer to this now, right? This is boring. There's hardly any intelligence over here. And this intelligence, right? There's two meanings to intelligence. The plant is smart. But this is information. This is a ton of information. This is metadata beyond metadata. The plant is pulling up into its green body and it's figuring out how to live in its world. All right. So just take a couple of seconds to ponder those numbers. 
all of these different kinds of microbes. And this is why the microbiome is really an important, important ingredient for soil health. Because in large part, the botanical world has this built-in health plan already. It doesn't need all of the agrochemicals that we throw at it. Sometimes, yes, but most of the time, it's the built-in health plan, i.e. the microbiome, i.e. all of this. These communities are intact and they're functioning and they're communicating. The built-in health plan, plan just thrums and hums along. And we, the humans, stand back in our gardens or on our farms and go, my God, this is, this is something to marvel at. And so if I haven't yet impressed upon you the importance of the microbial world, um, I'm going to do that in the next two slides so that you're firmly grounded in what this is all about. There was a brilliant, brilliant biologist, Lynn Margulis, who was actually at UMass Amherst. And she had a theory about the role of symbiosis in evolution. And her theory went like this. It was poo-pooed. People always thought, oh no, nature red in tooth and claw. There has to be direct conflict. That's how things evolve. Well, Lynn thought, I don't know. She'd spent an awful lot of time looking at some of the tiniest creatures on Earth. She had paleontology evidence. She had chemical evidence. She had biological evidence. And this is how her theory went. Somewhere around about three billion years ago, when microorganisms were the dominant life form on this planet, there were lots of different kinds, a photosynthesizer, an oxygen breather, a fast, darty little swimmer, and the archaea, the ancient ones. And what happened around two billion years ago, that swimmer met the archaea, and there was a merger, and the unthinkable happened. One of these microorganisms entered the other one, and they both survived. Because together they could do more than either one could do alone. And then we have a billion years pass or so, and we have the second merger. You have this fast little swimmer, and this oxygen breather joins. And what we have here is the forebear of mitochondria in our cells. Did you know that the mitochondria that are in the cells of all organisms are, were long, long ago a kind of a bacterium? And so that was our second merger. It's now a powered up microorganism with that mitochondrium. And so you had the photosynthesizers all along here going along. And the third merger was the photosynthesizer combining with this guy. So you now had go power and you had the chloroplast. You could utilize sunlight to make food. That line led to plants. The second merger led to fungi and to animals. And this is in part why we subtitled the book The Microbial Roots of Life, because it's true. All right, now, as a biologist, I always loved those diagrams of the tree of life because we were at the top. And adorned around us were lizards and plants and birds and butterflies and our cousin apes not too far away. And these were, these, this was all a fantasy, okay? <laughs> this was a fantasy built on our myopic view of vertebrates, and in particular, this vertebrate. We thought we ruled the roost. But in fact, what we have here, through, through genomic sequencing done um, in the last couple of decades, what we now know is that most of life on this planet is microbial. And everything on this tree of life, there's a big, big group here, we just call the bacteria. The archaea are just the ancient ones. So you see an M, a C, there's a story about the star. This is a sewage dweller that blew the whole story open. We write about that in the book. These are all microbes. And look, these are multicellular organisms for the most part over, over here, we call them the eukaryotes. There's m microbes here, and I, 
meant to title this slide, You Are Here and You Don't Matter Very Much, okay? <laughs> we are out here on this little tiny branch of the animal part of the tree of life. So this is sort of, I don't know, it's creepy, it's cool, it's disconcerting, and it might get you thinking, I wonder if I have a microbiome and if I want to know anything about it. You do, okay? You definitely do, and here's why. <laughs> right. <clears throat> poor, poor pig pen. <sighs> pig pen needs a new image um, because we associate microbes with dirt, with filth, and so on. I think it would have been interesting to sample pig pen's microbiome myself. And so we are, the truth is, we are coated inside and out with microorganisms, different than a plant's, but no less. And these microbial communities, they're indigenous to our bodies. They are supposed to be there. And by and large, if we did not have our microbiome, we would be profoundly, profoundly unhealthy. And in case you've been under a rock in the last five or 10 years, I doubt this crowd though, uh, this is just to give you a sense of how explosive this field has been. In particular, in the last, I don't know, eight to 10 years, if you were to go to PubMed, it's a, a public database of scientific literature, put in the word microbiome, these are the numbers of publications and how they're climbing, and it's through the roof and continues to be. And in this case, the later on you go along this graph, microbiome is mostly associated with the human microbiome. So this is clearly um, something we need to know more about. There's a ton of papers you can read, or you can read The Hidden Half of Nature and keep listening. Okay. So when it comes to our microbiome, one of the things about it is that if you were to take all of our bodily cells, our brain cells, our skin cells, and so on, and put them in one pile, and then you would take all your microbial cells, your microbiome, and put them in the other pile, it would be about a one-to-one -one ratio, if not three-to-one on the part of microbes to your own bodily cells. Again, this is either cool or creepy or disconcerting. When it comes to their genes, this is where we have around 23,000 genes in our genome that code for proteins. When you add in the genes of the bacteria that are a part of our microbiome, our genes shoot up to around two million, it's estimated. You throw in the rest of the members of our microbiome, the fungi, the virus, the archaea, whatever else hasn't been totally nailed down, and it's estimated that our total genome is somewhere around four to six million genes. So I don't need to tell you, we have our piddly 23,000, and then we got the millions that are provided by our microbiome, and this has something to do with our health, as I will go into. And in this exploration of the human microbiome, I took a very deep dive in particular into this, in particular um, because I faced a major health challenge halfway through writing this book. It was a cancer diagnosis, which is thankfully behind me. But I learned that cancer, wait a minute, the immune system, that's the job of the immune system, is to clean out these deranged abnormal cells. They're not supposed to be hanging around least of all, continuing to grow. It is the job of the immune system. And so I'm like, oh, immune system, swollen glands. Well, I think I need to know more. So I took a deep dive, and to of all places, I land in the human colon. That is not where I thought I was going when I started to look into the immune system. So just a, a, a quick little uh, description of our colon. It's the, about the lower third or so of our digestive tract. That middle area is called the lumen. It's got a thick layer of mucus to keep things moving along. And it turns out in this mucus, there are exudates. Exudates that feed members of our microbiome. Why? Most of our microbiome lives in our colon, not on the outside of our ear, not in the skies of our eyes or our dry elbow deserts or in between our toes. Most of it is in our colon. And the other interesting thing about our digestive tract is that about 70 to 80% of our immune system 
is wrapped around our colon in the form of different kinds of tissue and cells. So I thought this was really interesting. Wow, the colon, my immune system, and my microbiome. What is going on? This is what's going on, is a lot of freaking biology, okay? Biology that we all should be really, really interested in. A dendritic cell, that's just a kind of an immune cell. It's sort of a scout. It's a surveiller. It's out to collect information. And where does it go? There's a shapeshifter type of cell, too. It can travel up between your colon cells, and it will grab a molecular sample of bacteria. That molecular sample, if you've ever been to an allergist, allergists call this antigen. So it's a very specific kind of a thing. And dendritic cells, all their lives, right now inside of us, probably dendritic cells are doing their work. And they share all of that antigen and molecular information with PALs, PALs called immune cells, PALs called T cells. And all of these little spiky things on that T cell, those are receptors. And a dendritic cell comes along and it shows that antigen to a T cell. And T cells work based on the kind of antigen that is presented to them. Sometimes it's a kind of antigen and it does nothing at all. It's not the right kind for that particular T cell. Other times, it is the right kind of antigen. And so what you can see is going on here is, this is all representational, okay? There's way, way more bacteria, way, way more kinds of antigen than are shown here. Suffice it to say, some kinds trigger this kind of a T cell, other kinds trigger this kind. And why this all matters, here's where we start to put it together. Some kinds of antigen will activate pro-inflammatory T cells. Other kinds of antigen activate anti-inflammatory kinds of T cells. So inflammation these days, it mostly gets a bad rap. I would, I would guess that most of us in this room probably have a pretty negative connotation with inflammation. But in fact, that is our body's healing process, and we do need it. This is, this is what eats up deranged cells. This is what helps our wounds heal. This is what happens when we have a cold or a virus. It is the immune system's job to go and get that stuff and take care of it, eat it up, kill it, those kinds of things. But after the immune system has done its job, it needs to shut off because when you have inflammation going on and on and on, it becomes a wrecking crew. It becomes a wrecking crew inside of our body and there's a lot of collateral damage. So you want your immune system in there and then out right away. It's very much the Goldilocks situation. Just the right amount, just the right place, just the right time. And this whole view of bacteria, our colon, our immune system. This is a very, very different way to look at immunity. It's a really, really different way to look at our health because, wait a minute, I thought it was the absence of microorganisms that was the basis for health, not their presence. And certainly not their presence in particular communities, and certainly not their presence as basically um, the software, this is a giant, giant set of intelligence for our body to interpret and to filter and to read through, and that's what the immune system does. So, and yet, this is mostly what most of us think, right? We need to eradicate microorganisms. And the thing about the microbial world, it is, it is, it is filled with duality. And we don't like duality, our species. We like it black, or we like it white. We don't like a lot of gray. And germ theory was perfect because it was true for some microbes that you had a bacterium that could cause tuberculosis. You had a virus that could cause HIV and so on. So there was this one-to-one -one correlation. And so we figured one microbe's bad, they're all bad. We need to get rid of them. And disease has been with humanity since we came on to this earth. This is an image of the country doctor, Edward Jenner, who stumbled onto a vaccine for smallpox. Smallpox was the, one of the most dreaded 
dreaded diseases throughout our history. And this is, you know, as you would imagine, when you're losing thousands and thousands of people in a week, tens of thousands in a year to smallpox, that you would wake up and take great interest in the microbial world. This happens to be the smallpox virus. Another big concern that is still with us in some places is polio, and this is the polio virus. So there is the germ theory side. And if you go back even further, this is a bill of mortality from the city of London in 1664. This is very early epidemiological work. And the theory was, gosh, if we know why people are dying, then we can go in and prevent people from dying. What are they dying of? This is a list from this year in London. And I'll draw your attention to plague. 7,000 people in one week, right? This is going to color your view of the microbial world. And so it's important that we keep on top of the pathogens, but a very, very, very small part of the microbial world is pathogenic. By and large, most of it is neutral or helpful. But still, it has this duality about it that we need to keep the forefront of our, of our minds. Fast forward, smallpox is behind us, the plague is behind us. Something that's been pretty interesting um, that has come to light, especially in the post-war years, is that as we began to bring these infectious, these are, these are the germ theory kinds of diseases. We call them the infectious diseases, right? You get this germ, chances are you're, you could get one of these diseases. This all began to drop precipitously in the years represented up here. Why? Clean water had a huge amount to do with controlling infectious disease, vaccines, and antibiotics. These are all disease controllers and a way to manage diseases. But at the same time, clinicians and researchers are looking here, and these are the so-called chronic diseases. Once you get them, you don't tend to shake them. They're with you for a lifetime. They're chronic. Things like Crohn's, MS, type 1 diabetes, asthma. And you can see how much they are going up over time. And people are like, well, why? What, what, what is with this? Well, it's not just those diseases. It's also all of these things. It's looking like a result of some kind of scrambling of the immune system, where they're getting bad signals, or the wrong signal, or no signal. So these are, these are symptoms of a perturbed immune system and likely a perturbed microbiome. That is the thinking. And there's a lot of correlation out there right now. There's not a lot of causality. But this is going to be, this is, this is where the microbiome field is going to be very busy in the years to come, is unraveling these details to learn more about this. When there's a hypothesis about this shift from infectious diseases taking us down to chronic and autoimmune diseases taking us down, and it goes like this. Are we missing some of our microbes? This is sort of the operating hypothesis, because you think back to what the dendritic cell does with those molecular samples and how it activates T cells, and there's about a dozen different kinds of T cells involved in maintaining our health. So, Think about disrupting that flow of information from microbiome to immune system, and if we're missing some of these. Antibiotics have certainly scrambled our microbiome. These are like, these are powerful, powerful drugs, and we don't realize it because when we take them, most of the time, not all, but most of the time, it clears out the pathogen, and we feel better, not worse, unless you get side effects. But these are, these are like pesticides and herbicides and so on inside of our bodies. They're very effective at killing microbes. So there's some thought that antibiotics, especially early in life, can alter a person's microbiome. But what's not so obvious about what might be altering our microbiome is our diet. What are we sending down the hatch? In order to understand how our diet might affect our microbiome, we're going to take, we're going to go down the hatch, okay?